repeat people, love to see repeat visitors coming back. Um, my, and once again, um, I'm site director here. And my overall background, I have five years in the living history field. I've studied history. I've been a student of history since I was yay high. I've, um, it's just always been just a passion of mine, a love of mine. I love just and it just seems like every time I re go to research something or I read about something, you know, I, you always find something new. You uncover something new that you might not have known about before. And um, as I said, that led that led me to that, along with um, the fact that I'm also a musician and I'm involved in the arts field too, led me here to the living history world. I do everything from about French and Indian War up to Whiskey Rebellion, and I've done some Civil War, but not a, not a ton. I've also done a little bit of Edwardian. And um, I just, and I, there's something about each era that I really like, so. All right, so I am going to begin by doing a little bit of a, giving you a little bit of a rundown on, first of all, how these letters came about, how the letters from Woodville came about, the materials that made these letters, the paper, the pens, and the ink. Now a lot of people might be like, okay, well we know what, you know, how paper's made. But paper back then was not, it, it, it was not made the way it is today. Today it's made from wood pulp and, you know, trees and, but however, back in the day that was not the case. So what materials were used? All right, who maybe can tell me? Rags. Rags. Yes, rags. Rags were used. In fact, they were used so much that women were actually encouraged to save their rags and donate them to the local paper mills. Okay? And the way these paper mills would make the rags, and of course they said that um, on early American streets in the 18th, especially the 18th century, very little paper littered, there's actually no paper littered the streets are very little and nobody really wore rags because they were forced they were made to donate their rags <laughs> so I don't know how true that last part is especially depending on your station in life but but point being people were encouraged to donate their rags to the paper mills and the way this was made was the rags were put um, they were first doused with water and a lot of water was used for this technique in making the paper. Okay, it was also, it was diluted to the point of being what was called a thin slurry. And the slurry, that's basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It was almost like, just kind of like this, kind of like a slushy sort of material. And then what they would do is they would spread out that slurry onto a very fine screen and then press it down, okay, into, in the wood press. They would press it down, and that would squeeze out the remainder of the water, okay? And the goal was to get the fibers, like just kind of separate the weave of the rags into individual fibers of cellulose, which is made from natural plant fibers, okay? Now, this technique of paper making was is said to be first discovered in China in 200 AD. However, there's some Chinese paper that does date a little further back than that, about 400 years. But it is said in China that this particular technique is, you know, that's that was the central of where it got started. And then the um, that technique moved through the eventually the Middle East caught on. And then they were they traded with the Chinese, and then the Europeans caught on, and then it moved to Europe eventually. And it came to the Middle East in Europe at, at almost the same time, at about the 14th century. And so, however, in England, it really did not go over very well at first, and this is the reason, because due to the climate over in England, Wool was their choice of material, okay? And in order to make the paper, and the rags that needed to be donated, had to be made of plant fiber. 
which meant flax, hemp, things of that nature. All right, even in or late, a little bit later on in America, people would donate maybe their donate their old hemp ropes and have that made into paper as well. But in England, like I said, due to the climate, they used wool, which is an animal fiber, and they very, very, very soon found out that that just made horrible paper, at least in the technique that was had been brought over from China and the Middle East. So it actually, especially during the reign of King Charles II in 1666, he actually made it a law that people could not be buried in any plant fiber. So it was like, it was basically, e even in death, people had to, you know, had to be contributing their, their, clo their proper clothing, their linen, their hemp clothing, anything. They could not be buried. Yes. Yeah, cotton, when cotton became, you know, you know, when cotton became more popular and more prevalent, um, yes, they could not be, yes, they were not allowed to be buried in any sort of plant fiber. It, they, they could only be buried in wool or any, any type of animal fiber was fine, but never a plant fiber because they needed those, you know, those clothing, those rags to be basically recycled into into paper. So I thought that was per, that's a pretty interesting sure. little little piece of history. So that it was actually law that you couldn't you couldn't bury your dead, and there was actually a fine if you buried your dead in um, in plant fiber. Of course, one exception were plague victims, probably because plague victims you wanted to bear, get them buried and gone as soon as possible. You don't want to um, transfer it either. Exactly, exactly. You don't want to transfer it. So if it was a plague victim, you were kind of they, they were exempt, <laughs> you know, from that because they, you know, they, they wanted, you know, because they didn't want to be messing, they wanted to mess with those bodies as little as possible. But anybody else that, you know, died from natural causes or anything like that, no, you had to be buried in wool. So what year was that? 1666. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And the uh, wood pulp machine that did not come that 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 didn't quite make it start making its rounds until about the middle of the 19th century. So that was when we started to see the more you know more wood pulp paper being produced. But um, yes. But I am going to show you now my little display here. Yeah. All right. So. This is a writing lap desk, and this was something that was very frequently used by a lot of people. I mean, it's very convenient. Um, you can, you know, just set it if you want to set it on your table, you can. However, you can take it with you into your study, or you can take it, take it really anywhere, just set it on your lap. There's your laptop. You know? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, 18th century laptop. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can store your supplies in here. And yes, you were good to go. Now some writing desks, um, not on this one that I have, but there are some writing desks where you can actually remove this top part from here, and that's where you can store your quills, your inkwell, anything else that you, anything else that you want. So yeah, and like you said, it was basically pre-laptop, you know? So yes, but these were actually quite common, all right? And this is a penmanship book. All right, if you wanted to, you can even pass that around if you like, and you can just see some of the penmanship exercises that were put in there, and there's ones for ladies, ones for gentlemen, so yes, and these were used especially in schools as well, and this is actually, this is, I found this at an antique store, this is um, Pendant L'Exil by Victor Hugo, written from in six, 1682 to 1870, 1862 to 1870. So, you know, this is just something just so you can get a feel for maybe some of the paper. Um, by the way, uh, you will have an opportunity to look at some original documents uh, that Nina will be having. However, we do ask that you just make sure you have clean, dry hands. So if you want to handle a document, just wash your hands first. So, but my hands are clean and dry, so, <laughs> yeah, so. Well, that's rag paper? 
So this, yeah, this is basically kind of how it would have felt. Really not that much different from regular paper. In fact, up until about maybe the 19th century, like later 19th century, your typical chemist would not have been able to tell the difference between pulp paper and, you know, and, fi and, you know, and, and uh, plant fiber paper just because they had it down to a science that much. But, you know, later in the, 19, in the uh, 1800s, they were, you know, they developed a little bit more of a technology, so they were able to start to tell. But yes, but this, you know, this would just give you an idea of, you know, what that paper felt like. And like I said, Nina has also has some samples too. Besides trees and plants, anyway. Yes. <laughs> and this is just, this is just a little, a little notebook that I have. This particular marbling design was actually quite popular, uh, particularly in the 18th century, um, and. This also, I got this from the Colonial Printer and Book Bindery in Fort Frederick, and he's amazing. Uh, I love his stuff. If you ever get a chance to check him out, do so. But yeah, but this is also, it's, it's imitation. It's, kind of, it's an imitation of the type of paper they would have used. So if you want, you could. As are these, like all of these are kind of, are basically, they're imitations of the paper that would have been used. Yes. Now, we get to our friends, the quills, okay? And quills and like pens and ink has pretty much been around in some form or another forever, all right? Um, in fact, some of the very first pens were formed in ancient Egypt using papyrus rods. However, those tips didn't last very long, so they started using quill, you know, quill pens, which basically they would take the feathers of very large birds, uh, whatever birds were on hand, and you, you could take a pen knife or, or anything and you could sharpen, you know, just kind of cut it and sharpen it to a point, and then you have your pen. And um, ink was made from pretty much anything you, you could, you know, you could find but mainly you wanted to have it made from dark colored berries, berries that stained like blackberries, poke berries, um, also walnuts. A lot of ink was made from walnuts as well. Um, and something you could make it if you had those in your, um, out, just outside your log cabin, you can definitely uh, make it yourself. There are many, many receipt books, recipe books out there um, from the 18th century and earlier as well on how to make your own ink. Uh, so you can make it yourself, uh, you can have it imported. Uh, some, sometimes they were imported from Europe, sometimes the Middle East, sometimes Asia, because uh, you know obviously the use of a quill and inkwell was actually very commonly used worldwide. And for a long time, this is, this is what people used, okay? Then, however, when you start to get into the aristocracy or a journalist um, or further into the 19th century, um, these start to become more popular. The, the quills with the metal tipped, uh, metal tipped pen. And the metal tipped pen, I, re I did read that metal tipped pens were quite popular in Rome. However, with the fall of Rome, of course, Everything else fell with it, so people were pretty much having to start from scratch again. So these actually didn't become quite popular again until the later 18th century and then into the 19th century. So, and, and even in the 18th century, as I said, you had to be very wealthy or a journalist to have the privilege of owning one of these. So you can own this, or you can own this. So it was. Yeah, really up to you. You had your choice. And after the presentation, if you would like to try your hand at quill writing, you absolutely can. Um, I can show you how to do it. And right now, we'll bring Nina up, and she, I'm sure, I'm sure, will be very, very fascinating with her letters. So I don't so much fun. We actually have so this box here. Um, is part of our Isaac Craig letters. Actually, these are the Isaac Craig letters that we have. Um, the Craigs were cousins. Uh, by marriage, Amelia Neville Presley's sister married Isaac Craig, so that's how those 
families are connected. So we have some of those letters dating back to 1812 at the earliest. Um, so that is, we actually had, um, we had a class at California University of Pennsylvania transcribe these for us. And as a, it was a class project. <laughs> yeah, it was for it was great. Read, yeah. um, they had a class project, and they transcribed each one of the letters. We had photocopies made for them, and so they they didn't even have to come and actually handle the letters. We had photocopies made, and uh, so they could do digital zooming on them, and um, so they were able to. If you want to take a look at this after the fact, we'll have it out for you up here to flip through, see some of the things that they were talking about that they found really important. A lot of it has to do with rent and rent collection, actually, but there is some news, you know, oh, I've been transferred to such and such for, please forward all my correspondence to there from now on, so, and that's a really interesting way to reconstruct sure. the lives of individuals. Brings it to life. Absolutely. Um, and just before before we start handling documents. Um, I, a couple things, I was actually taking notes during Tiffany's talk because <laughs> a couple of things came to mind, um, just some interesting points. And the one thing I thought, when you mentioned the enforced donation of your, yeah. your plant fiber garments yes. for paper reconstruction, I just thought, oh, what? Because archeologists are always thinking about preservation factors for different materials and how that can affect uh, reconstruction of a site or um, and things like that. So things preserve differently in the ground, but they also preserve differently due to the human cultural factors of uh, what materials do we curate? What materials are valuable to save in this art museum? Um, what things do we toss and throw away? And this is the type of factor maybe that leads to less garments of plant fiber surviving for us to study. So we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at um, collections of historical costume. Maybe that's why they're underrepresented is because they were recycled in the past. You don't really think, you think of recycling as a 21st century enforced <laughs> policy, but here we are hearing about 15th century recycling. So that was really a fascinating thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also thinking about um, how would I see, how would I find traces of this in the archeological record? Um, if, for example, if there was an excavation of Woodville, how would I be able to identify any of these things if they had sat in the ground for about 300 years? Because if we're thinking about it, the paper, that's a plant-based material, the feather is a natural material, those things probably aren't going to survive. So without archives, without historical libraries, most of these things could just deteriorate. Uh, just even if you have things in your basement with poor preservation conditions there, uh, maybe that's why, or that's definitely a reason why we don't have as many of these papers um, as existed in the past. So maybe in the future we might only find the metal nib of that Quill or the fancy pen. Yes. The, the, fancy the wealthy pen, pen we yes. might find. <laughs> the rich people's pen. Yes. <laughs> or the inkwell itself that might have some traces of ink inside it that you could do some chemical testing on to reconstruct what the ink was made from. Um, and the stand itself, that, those were the only things that I could think of would really survive in um, underground preservation. In, especially in southwest Pennsylvania. So just a couple of thoughts. So now I will hand around some documents. So this first one is actually a piece of a ledger, and it dates to 1793. So we're going to be very careful not to fold or crease it in any way. Um, can you make out any of the handwriting on there? Taylor. Um, I should have my glasses on. Uh, by <laughs> Cash, by other jobs. The Oh yeah, it's okay. Keep passing. It's just an example of how challenging it is to read it. And you guys know from taking a look at that ledger, it's the old handwriting and how complicated it can be. It appears that the monetary amounts, like in the ledger, are not in our monetary. It's like English pounds, mm -hmm. I think. And <laughs> 1793, most likely. Right. Yeah, that's kind of cool. 
Okay, and this is our oldest <laughs> letter, very delicate. <laughs>
So here's another. This one's 1828. So we're going to skip forward in time so that you can see kind of evolution maybe in handwriting. But again, remember these are individuals who have different handwriting anyway. Um, so this one actually folds open. We just have to be very careful. Oh, wow. Again, you see, you can see the damage, the creasing, and yeah. uh, I think Jeez. the person who donated these, we are lucky that they saved them, but I believe they were stored um, in a room that didn't have climate control, and something as easy as that can, yes. So, here you go, if you wanna, you know, you can turn it over, take a look, but just be very careful, make sure you support the full document, just because this one is a bit damaged, and when you're opening, very careful. Let's see, I can start another one. Oh, this is really hard to read. Yeah. <laughs> very, very slanted. They have all kinds of... Um, if you can get one word, it usually helps. Um, it just get one Sometimes they can pick up the, the ink. I don't want to open it. Yeah. Pick it up. A little bit of ink and, and help us out. The, uh, Pick out the, the letters better. That's one of our goals in the transcription and preservation process is to also get our documents scanned. The state has a really, really nice scanner that they lend out to small institutions. So we're um, we're looking to get it for a couple of weeks next summer and scan our documents. Yeah, and, and then what bill will be going 24 hours a day? Yeah, during that time, hurry up, 24 <laughs> seven. Yeah. So that's the goal. It's like we're watching the history uh, uh, programs, and they do so these documents from yes. papyrus and, mm -hmm. and the internet. It's, it's yeah. exactly <laughs> right. So I'm going to start this one with you. This is our oldest one. We think. 1828. That's older than me. I like that. 18. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> in this collection, the latest is what I mean to say. Um, we think about 1830 on that one. That's cool. And then, the, so the rest of our papers that we have are part of the Callum Renshaw collection, um, and that was the family that resided here after the Nevilles, in, uh, up until 1973. So those papers came to us, as these did, from a descendant, and um, we have several hundred documents, if not a thousand, and we are, um, we have photographs, we have letters, we have legal documents, so looking to get all of those preserved and well researched because they have so much information, um, even just about this area in that time period. And also there are photographs of the house and grounds, so that oh, helps nice. us to interpret yeah. here. Photographs? Uh, yes. Not many of the house and grounds, but there are some. It's interesting. Yeah. This one has the Captain Henry Kevin Craig. Second Artillery. Craig Street is out in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And those are the same Craigs. Second Artillery. We might be able to trace down who he was in the military records. Absolutely. Now, can you photocopy any of this, or is that forbidden? Um, it's not forbidden. But I mean, it when might you're damage doing the. Work. Um, any light in a sustained manner is going to be damaging. Um, light for several seconds, and that's what all scanning technology is going to be. Yeah. Some exposure uh, is okay. You just don't want to do it over and over again forever. And then that one will work its way back. That's really cool. Yeah. Any other questions about the documents we have, yeah, or? I, here's a selfish question. Sure. Will they ever put anything online? So that, like, if you're not able to get on, or you want to do research at home, uh, that's say also, so. mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the goal. Oh, no, it's the goal. Um, mm -hmm. That's the whole goal of our digitizing the records. We want to make them available to, uh, to the public for researchers. We want people to know that we have this collection here. So, and we want people to be able to use it and engage with it. Now, so, do you have to get family permission, what you can release and what you can't, since um, the family donated it? I think it came to us in more of like a will situation. Uh -huh. So we do technically own the items. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I'm selfishly also <laughs> excited because yes. those documents are going to be part of my PhD dissertation coming up. That's going to be like the, a lot of the historical research for that because we have several artifacts that are associated with the Cowans um, that have never been fully examined because it's not part of the time period interpreted here. And I'm really interested in it anyway, so. Um, and the documents are gonna form a lot of background for me about regarding those artifacts and where they came from, so. It's interesting. So you mentioned your dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, is that printed? Or no, you have to no, I'm verbally? going to be working on it. I'm going to be working on it. And I mean, in the future. We'll oh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> if I do a good job, I really hope this is going to work. I'm not sure how that works. Um, so um, you write your dissertation, and it is, um, it's like pretty much usually a book. And you submit it to your university, and sometimes it can be challenging to find those dissertations. Um, but you can find them. They're online databases, and I know the university libraries, you have to submit a bound copy of your dissertation or thesis to the university library. So that's often a good place to look for kind of more obscure sources. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal is always that you do a good enough job that you can submit it to a publisher or a little bit of a revised version even to a publisher and Great. have your first book out of it. What degree and what university are you talking about? Um, <laughs> starting at the University of South Carolina in okay. August and it would be a PhD in anthropology, so archaeology concentration and yeah, the professors are really interested in Woodville and when I ask them, you know, could I study this there and They've got some historical archaeologists. Who just for you. worked out. I wish you all the success. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting that they only need to put the word Pittsburgh on it. They don't put Pennsylvania or anything else. Yeah, I guess. No zip codes. <laughs> and, well, <laughs> yeah, right, every, this is Amelia Craig. And yeah, Pittsburgh. Yeah. That's funny. The population is rather small. Not obviously. even like a Absolutely. street address or a street number. Really? I love, love the way they I guess speak. your postmaster yeah. is charged yeah. with that knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> you need to know. I guess yeah. it was yeah. small enough, this yeah. area. Yeah. There weren't that many people. Well, well, also, you know, like it's probably pre really organized federal post office. Before, I mean, before it was the way we trust it to be now. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people probably had private messengers that they used to just hand deliver, especially elite citizens that we're talking about, like really wealthy people would be able yeah. to just say, here's someone in my staff who can directly yeah. I deal with this. Who, like how the soldiers would do things. Because the soldiers probably wouldn't have that much money if they would have had private messengers. So how would they get sent their mail to their <laughs> um, <laughs> family and stuff? Well, depending on the commission, some you know commissioned officers did have a lot of money, so they probably would have even had for themselves, yeah. yeah. But so, for the, but for the average soldier, I guess it's just the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. The average, yeah. Well, that's part. That's yeah. a consideration, of course. And but then somebody would do it for them. You know, sometimes. Yeah. Um, Is there a scribe? Are you asking, like, or just an army scribe? Somebody in in the you know. Is, I'm not actually sure. That's a good question for some of our um, military mm -hmm. history. Well, see, well, yeah, yeah. are really interested yeah. in the military archaeology. Yeah, and that's a good question to follow up. You know, like early, early American history, how did the mm -hmm. average soldier pass that information absolutely. back to his family? How they get back there? All right, well, yeah. I absolutely will do that. Uh, is that place is fascinating as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> I wonder who, did, who donated that ledger. I still would love to know who it was. It came to Carnegie and that, that Mark. That'd be somebody interested in the, uh, yeah. the war. Yeah. Well, sure. Oh, whiskey be better than us. Did you get a question? Have you found anything referring to bees or honey or wax? Um, in, in the these, materials, in those or any other materials relating to Woodville? Um, not yet. But like I said, we've only looked at bees so far. And this is one box, and we've got you know hundreds more documents to look at. So if we do find anything, I would be happy to let you know. Okay. Would you put it online? Would you put in like a mention of it mm -hmm. being discovered? 
Sure, if we find something interesting, I could work with Tiffany on getting something on our social media or a newsletter of some kind. Stop by, we found something. Yeah, that's a great idea. I saw a sign about bees when we came in. Where are they? So there have been bees. Okay. And I, they believed that the colony survived the winter, but it it didn't. So they're gonna, they are gonna try again. They okay. move somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's two things. There was a, a, a colony, in, in, an imitation of the beehive, the mm -hmm. scalp, mm -hmm. like the beehive hairdo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like the oven. <laughs> yes, uh, the yeah. beehive oven. Uh -huh. um, that did that die out in the last year? Towards the end of last not, year, not, yeah. Not this past, the uh -huh. previous winter. There's a wild bee tree there. Mm -hmm. A wild what? Wild bee bees. tree. Bee tree. Feral bees. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh really? They, wow. they, bees so are not native. Honeybees are not native to the Western Hemisphere. Oh. But some of them have escaped yeah. and live on their own. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I've had them move into my house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. they the colonized your house. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They like this spot and, and near my porch, and, and they there's a little there was a little hole, and they they went in. Yeah. If, if they get in the house, they bring the honey, and it, it seeps and, and attracts insects. Oh and yeah. You don't want them in your house. Oh, yeah. around the house. We have them in our cottage yeah. right now, but they're not bees. They're uh, hornets. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. No. Red striped hornets. Yeah. Red striped hornets. Have you yeah. ever heard of that? Hornets? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we call wasp hornets. Yeah. 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 They yeah. spread for them four times, and they are it's still there. Yeah. The paper wasps. There's also carpenter bees that bore oh, yeah. the wasps. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Perfect terrible. little holes. I've seen this. Yeah. They're fascinating. Uh, these are honey bees. Yeah, if we, we see any more, reference yeah. to honeybees, we will be sure to let you know and post it. Yes. Okay. And also the tavern led if we great. any mention of that yes. or the ledger or anything. At one time it was called the Coats Tavern. Okay. But I don't think it was that and we don't know what it was yeah. called way back when. Way back when. I would love to know. <laughs> Absolutely. C O A T E S. Yes. General Hempel has at least two full pages. He's mentioned that. I think Presley's in there. Is it Craig in there? Yeah. I know. Craig was not in there. Craig. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe he wasn't. Uh, well, as well for you, <laughs> Maybe he didn't set up a charge account because these people were not paying cash. Yeah, the letter Maybe was in the accounts received. Maybe you never know. <laughs> Yeah, it was a nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you cool. don't think of anyone married in wool? Now we know why. We know why. <laughs> exactly. Yes. One more question. Mm -hmm. uh, that was England, 1666. Uh -huh. But did that cover Scotland, Ireland, and uh, Wales, or, or just England? Do you think? Um, I would I, I would think that it covered the entire um that that entire area just because. The climate is, you know, like like I said, it, it had a lot to do with climate. Okay, so England's very very kind of cool. You know, they had a cooler mm -hmm. climate, mm -hmm. and then Ireland, you have cooler. Like, it. in fact, there's always jokes about how in Ireland it rains every day. You know, yeah. <laughs> so and then Scotland. So yeah, so so, it, as, so long as the climate was very consistent throughout those entire um, aisles. Then it very likely I would say applied to. Um, I mean, I, I could find out for sure, definitely. But I would, my guess would be yes. You know, especially since, um, you know, when you say like the, the king of like the, the whole England thing. or Britain, it's usually <laughs> for a long time it was king of yeah, the entire, Brit you know, what yeah. were called the British Isles, yeah. much to the chagrin of the. Irish, Scottish, and the Welsh, so, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, any other yes. questions? Very interesting. Yeah, the whole thing, very, yeah, very interesting. interesting. Yes, good. And, uh, yes, I'm sure it's a be a long time to prepare, and we appreciate it. Oh, no problem. <laughs> and, yeah, we, um, yeah, feel free to uh, browse. We have a couple of related gift shop items here, and, um, yeah, feel free to browse if you'd like. Try your hand at Will writing, I could definitely, I could show you. Oh, yeah, yeah let's absolutely. Take away the documents before the name comes out. Yes, uh, <laughs> just yes. in case. <laughs> and please help yourselves. Something he said, okay. Yeah. And he 
goes and, right. and <coughs> gets the chemical do? traces out of pots in the Middle Ages. And, and, and then there's that to start crazy life, brewery and then in to southern Delaware, again, then have which makes things all like that. All of the air all over your paper. So what you can do. I love it. There is some sort of like an Aztec. Yes, but it imitates what the paper would have been like back then. So, all right. So it's not the only Just another way people are going to do this with history and archaeology and new generation interests. So you just dip it just enough. Like, you know, just enough. And then you want to dab it. Okay? Dab it here just to make sure. All right, and then what you're going to do? And that's they don't to, make okay. it that funny. Mm -hmm. Now so you funny. want really, really to just really, really, really hold your wrist Absolutely. up like so. You don't that's want so to be putting all over the paper. Are you? Uh, okay. I'm assuming you And then this is how you want to have yes. your thumb yeah, and your index finger. Okay, you touch it. And then mm -hmm. what we're going to do is the manager's coming and died out. Yeah. But I think we have enough to talk about. I get fancy. Talk all afternoon. Mm, about like so. The, the all right. The interaction <laughs> with these. There you go. It's not great. Oh, I mean, that'll be able to be a bad It's your turn. Do not hold your hand. Which way is it? Yeah. Okay, so the point really wants to The point has to go. That's all I can think of is. The point is remains on bonds. Like an old fountain. Yes, yeah, yeah, basically, yes. Leftover, like an old fountain pen. And don't forget, and then you want to hold it right where that little line of ink ends. Okay. 